right. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you today. I want to take a minute and just say hello to everybody here at the North Campus and hello everybody over at the South Campus and everyone joining us online from wherever you're joining us from. Come on, North Campus. Let's tell them how much we love them. We love you so much. We truly are. We are one church in different locations and multiple locations, but we're one family. And I want you to know how much we love you and we're praying for you. And I know that many people are still coming out of a difficult time after the storm that came through and maybe you've lost power or hopefully you have your power back by now, but I know some people still didn't have hot water. So if there's any way that we can help you, please let us know. We want to be a part of your family and help you during this time. And then that's another reason you need to be in a group. We have life groups and our life groups have come around each other and helped each other. And if you're not in a group, here's just a shameless plug to get in a group today. Uh, you can go to the lobby at our physical location and sign up there or go online and try to find a group that works for you. But we're better together. I fully believe that. We're not good alone, and we need each other. So go get in a group. All right, we're in a series today, week three of a series called Song of Songs, where we've been going through a book of the Bible. Uh, it's also known as Song of Solomon. And if you don't know where this book is, because many people avoid this book, they're like, I don't know, I don't know about that, so I'm just not going to read it. Uh, it's, it's after Ecclesiastes, so it's like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. All of those books are written by Solomon. And he was the, the wisest man to ever live, according to the scripture. So we're studying this book, this book of romance. And this book is a, a song that he wrote, essentially, about a relationship. And we've been looking at this relationship. And a lot of people, like I said, they kind of avoid this book because they don't understand it. So I'm trying to help give some context to it. But it is, it's a book a lot of people read as an allegory or a picture of our relationship with Jesus or his relationship with the church. And it should be read that way as well. But it's also a physical relationship that we've been looking at between Solomon and a Shulamite woman. And so we're going to continue in that today. But before I get into it, I like to also kind of review the rules. Every time I do a relationship series, we need some rules so that one, we're listening for ourselves. You know, it's very easy, especially today, uh, to nudge your spouse next to you and be like, he's talking to you. You know, I might be talking to them, but I'm also talking to you. So listen for yourself today. And then the second one is also uh, listen, don't listen through the filter of your past. You know, we all have a past. Maybe you have failed in relationships. Maybe you have multiple failed marriages. And I don't want you to listen through that filter of hurt from the past, but say, okay, God, I'm going to make a decision today, no matter what's happened before, that I'm going to do things your way going forward and only look to the future today. So that, that's, that's a rule we need to have so we can hear what God wants to speak to us. Okay, so in this particular series, we, we started in week one talking about attraction and the right attraction and how what you want to be attracted to in a spouse and really how to be attractive spiritually. I can't help you be attractive physically, but you can be more attractive <laughs> spiritually. So that's what we can work on. So if you missed that, go back and listen to that. And then last week, we talked about times and seasons and how every relationship or relationships go through seasons and there's a progression to that. And we looked at their dating and courting relationship. Let me give you a heads up of where I'm going next week. Next week, we see that they get into an argument. And we're going to talk about conflict resolution. Because if you're in any form of relationship, you've experienced conflict. And if you haven't, it's coming. Okay, it's a part of relationships. Everybody has disagreements. Everybody has fights or arguments, whatever, heated discussions, whatever you want to call them. But we need to learn how to do them right so that we can have a right resolution on the other side. And so that's coming next week. So you want to be a part of that. But today, as promised, I'm, I'm talking about godly sex. And we're going to be looking at this relationship with them. And so I've given you warnings every week about what's coming today. It's a little more PG-13 in the sense of if your kids are 13 or older, they're welcome to stay in. And really, if they're younger, they're welcome. That's up to your discretion. But I think that our teenagers need to hear what the Bible says about this topic. Because I promise you, parents, many times we're naive and we don't think they're hearing about it. But they are. They're hearing about it from their friends. They're hearing about it from media. It's in movies and television. They sneak it into advertisements on games. It's everywhere, and you don't even realize it. But what they're seeing is a distorted view. And what we need to see is God's view. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And so I'm just giving you that fair warning. If your kids are under the age of 13 or you don't want them in here, we have a great children's ministry, and you're welcome to take them there. 
but it will, I promise you, I've, I've done my best to make this appealing for everybody, okay? All right, so I almost titled this message a song title from the 90s from a band called Salt and Peppa. Um, <laughs> If you know who salt and pepper are, then you get it. If you don't, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. It's really not important. But that's, that's what I was going to title it. But it's not titled that. And I'm not even telling you the title. You can look it up later. Anyway, anyway, point is this. You don't have to look far in our culture to see a distorted view of sex. This is, this is one of the things the world has gotten wrong. And the church, by and large, as a whole, has avoided this topic and we've, we've not talked about it because, one, maybe it's uncomfortable. We don't know what to say. But when our lack of communication on it has left people to think, oh, this is something that's not godly. This is something that belongs to the world. Or maybe even worse, that, oh, it, that's the devilish thing, right? But the devil did not create sex. He, he can't actually create anything. And so the first thing I want you to understand is that God created sex. The devil perverts it. The devil cannot create anything. All that he does is take something that God meant to be holy and pure and beautiful, and he twists it and he perverts it. He does the same thing with God's word. You can see from the very beginning of scripture, he tried to twist and pervert God's words to Adam and Eve because he is a created being, not a creator. So the enemy cannot create anything. He only perverts it. And this is what I believe that he has done is he has perverted what God meant to be beautiful. And you can look at the scriptures and there's tons of scriptures in the Bible on this topic, on the way that God created it to be. It meant to be beautiful and holy. And so I'll I want you to understand that the reason it gets out of bounds is because people don't put the parameters that we talked about last week around this topic. It's not in the right container, which is for marriage. And so it destroys and it hurts people and nobody talks about it. I love what Mark Driscoll said about it. He said this, he said, sex isn't a God to be worshiped. It isn't gross to be avoided. It's a gift to be enjoyed in marriage. This is the two extremes we see. In the world, it's become a God that people worship, and they chase after it, and it becomes the most important thing, and it gets out of bounds, and it damages people. But it's also not gross to be avoided, and that's what sometimes the church can do. and say, well, we shouldn't talk about that. We don't need to know about that, and we need to figure that out on our own. And so then people don't know what to do, and they think it's gross, and they don't know how to handle it. But really, it's a gift from God to be enjoyed in marriage. That is the container or the context for this topic. So I just wanted to to set the scene there to let you know that this is something God created. So can we just exhale and loosen up a little bit this morning? Okay. I know some people, some people seem a little uptight. Also notice there's a lot more men here today than normal. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Same amount. I'm just trying to loosen up. All right. So we've been following this journey. We're about to get back into this journey of, of they, were, they were attracted to each other. And we saw that early on. Then we saw their dating and their courtship. And if you look at the end of Song of Songs chapter 3, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to paraphrase it. It's about five verses that we see their, their wedding day, so to speak. And I find it interesting because it says that Solomon like rides up on this horse and there's a cloud of smoke behind him. And it's this brilliant picture. And it says that he's covered in all of these fragrances and perfumes. And who knows if that was the cloud, I could just see him just being like, you know, walking into it, spraying all this cologne, but he rides up and it's funny because today in weddings, the wedding day is all about the bride. Like it's all about her, but in here it's all about the groom. I mean, he was the one that was showing up and he had 60 groomsmen and they were all there with swords to protect him. Again, as we talked about building a wall around each other, they were there to protect that marriage. And then there's a beautiful picture, if you go to read this later, of his mother who puts a crown on his head. And it's just a, a sign and a picture of honor <clears throat> from the mother to the, to the kids for this wedding. And it's a beautiful picture of the, of the family relationship of honor that should be there, I think, in a marriage. And so they get married, and then it says uh, that his heart was rejoicing, and now they're on their honeymoon. So we're going to jump into Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> now he's speaking to her, and he says, How beautiful! You are my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Remember I told you there'd be some great lines in this one, men. This is not one of them again, okay? Your hair is like a flock of goats. That sounds weird, right? He's not saying you got goat hair, okay? That's not what's happening here. Again, I think you got to clarify it or some of you are going to try to use this and it's not going to work. 
the goats used to graze on this hill from Gilead and, and they would look like they were flowing down the hill. And what's happening here is she's let her hair down. Jewish women t- traditionally wore their hair up and she's taken her hair out and she's let it down and he's looking at her hair flowing down and he's complimenting her. He said, no, no, your hair, it truly is beautiful. And then he goes on to say, your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn coming up from the washing once again. Not a good pickup line, okay? If you were to paint a picture of this woman so far, she's got goat hair and sheep for teeth, right? This is messed up. But then what he says next is hilarious. Each has its twin, not one of them is alone. What is he saying here? I know you're not from West Virginia or Arkansas because you got all your teeth. I'm just messing. I'm just kidding. We have some people this morning from West Virginia, Arkansas. I just said, is it okay if I say a joke? Anyway, he's saying, oh, Your teeth are beautiful, and I love that you have them all. That's essentially, each one has its twin. That's what he's saying. You got them all. That's a beautiful mouth of teeth you have there. He's just complimenting her. It is wrong, and I apologize. We have to forgive. Okay, moving moving on. Let's go to the next verse. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples, or cheeks, some translation would say, behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. What is he trying to say here? She's, she's blushing. Her cheeks are turning red. And because of his complimenting her, she's now blushing. And, and I think it's also interesting that this is the second time a veil is mentioned. In that day, women wore a veil over their face, and, and they were normally outside of a family member would not allow a man to see their face until they were married. And so he may have been seeing her face for the first time, right? That's why he was so impressed she had all of her teeth. She was like, thank God I didn't see your mouth before. I'm so glad you have all your teeth. And I couldn't imagine what that would be like, but I started thinking, you know what? 2020 was probably a lot like that for a lot of people. If you started dating in 2020 and got engaged, you might have been like, oh, thank God you have all your teeth because you've been wearing a mask and I haven't seen anything. I'm so glad I was married before this last year. You better have some good eyes in 2020, right? That's all you can see. Anyway, we'll keep going. I had some other ideas, but I'm going to move on. All right, okay, I already went for it. Your neck is like the Tower of David. Once again, men, not a great pickup line. But that was a thing of honor, actually. The Tower of David was a place of honor, and, and he, was, he was telling her, I'm honoring you. I, I think this is beautiful. Built with courses of stones, on it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. He was talking about maybe jewelry that she was wearing. And, and, and if you notice this progression, he was talking from the hair, then to her eyes, then to her cheeks, then to her lips, then to her mouth. He, he has been making his way down and just talking about how beautiful that she is. And the first thing I want you to know about this topic is that God's way is affirming. He's been very affirming to her. He's, he's using his words to affirm how, how beautiful she is. Listen, your words are incredibly important when it comes to physical intimacy. What you say and how much affirmation you give your spouse is incredibly important. Men, don't expect her to be ready if you have not been affirming her all day. It, you you got to take some time to fill her bucket and affirm her. Right. Long before you make a move, you need to be affirming her with your words. I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase before, but it's a widely talked about phrase in relationship conferences and marriage conferences. And that is that women are like crockpots. Men are like microwaves. How many of you have heard that before? Right. I mean, men, you can hit the 30 second button where where food's warmed up, ready to go. Right. (laughs) Women, it, you need hours, eight hours to get a good cooked meal. I mean, it's, ingredients got to simmer together for a little bit, and it takes some time, right? I'm, it's funny because it's true. Um, <laughs> but you got, it takes some time. You've got to begin to invest with your words and affirm. And if you were to read this entire chapter, you'll see that Solomon, for 11 verses, talks to her before he touches her. What is he trying to say? I, you need to take time to affirm in this relationship, and that's incredibly important. Another way to look at this, and this is really for the men, is that God, godly sex starts before the bedroom. You've, it, you don't just go in and be like, oh, let's go. No, it starts earlier in the day. Let me give you some great tips, men. If you just start your day by taking out the trash, making breakfast, do some things around the house, wash the dishes, you're, you're turning the crock pot on, okay? 
bathe the kids when you get home, right? Put them to bed, pray with them, have meaningful conversations with your wife, okay? That pray with your wife in the morning. That this is, these are all the things that begin the spiritual attraction and emotional attraction that prepares the way for physical attraction. This is the crock pot slow approach that we have to take. I'm going to give you men, I'm, men, I'm a man, so I'm going to speak to you from a man's perspective. I'm going to tell you something that will really help you. Learn non-sexual touch. I, even now, some of you are like, what does that mean? It's touch that's non-sexual. I mean, I don't know how you just walk by and hug her, give her a kiss on the cheek and walk away. Don't expect anything else. Just walk away. Later in the day, brush your hair behind her ears. Oh, your eyes are so beautiful. And walk away, sir. Don't stay there. <laughs> Go on a walk and hold hands and only hold hands. Like you're just preparing the crock pot for later. But it's a lot of affirmation. And your words are incredibly important. Not just men, women. Your words are incredibly important when it comes to affirming. So he had been affirming her and talking about all of her features and how beautiful she is. And then we go into the next verse here. He says, your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. This is not as gross of a verse as you think. And I was a kid, I used to be like, skip this whole book. You know, like <laughs> if that word was in there, I was a kid. So I couldn't, I was a childish, you know, so I couldn't talk about it. Anyway, what this picture is actually a beautiful picture of something that's incredibly important when it comes to marriage in this particular topic. He's painting a picture of fawns or deer in a pasture grazing among the lilies. What is this a picture of? This, when you were, if you were to look at this in a scene, you would think that's peaceful, that's calm, that's not aggressive, that's not abrasive, right? That's a, that's a gentle picture. Men, it's not a picture of a lion rushing in after its prey and scaring the fawns off, right? Your, your wife is, is not a prey to be won, but a woman to be loved. And this is a beautiful picture that God's way is tender. You don't rush in and scare your wife. I mean, men, again, we're a microwave, but they are a crock pot. And this beautiful picture of tenderness is what he's showing here. And really, I, uh, I wrote this down because I believe this to be the truth in my own notes, is that the marriage bed... Uh, in, in the best intimacy in the marriage bed is when the other person is preferred. When you care about their thoughts, their likes, their dislikes, their feelings, their emotions. It's not all about you. It's a tender, gentle approach. And Solomon knew this, and he was saying, you're not just here to fulfill all my fantasies. No, I, I'm here to be a gentle covering for you. That love is tender. There's a beautiful, beautiful picture here. One of the things that, that you can understand here in a relationship is that women desire tenderness and men desire responsiveness. A woman wants a tender approach and a man just wants responsiveness, okay? So men, you gotta work on your approach. That's just the reality. If you're, if you're married, work on your approach. Care about the details. Be patient, be gentle, be caring, affirming, all of those little detailed things that help with your approach. Women, make an approach, right? Just, just make an approach, you know? Don't make your husband be the only person making an approach here, okay? Make an approach. Now, he wants you to want him. You know, it, men desire that responsiveness that you also feel something towards me. And so there's this cycle of tenderness and responsiveness that creates a beautiful relationship in the context of godly sex. Okay, I'm going to move on. Next verse. Verse 6, he says, until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of incense. What's he saying here? He's singing a song. So he was singing all night long, all night, right? This is what he's saying. I'm just reading the Bible. And I really feel like Lionel Richie owes him some money because thousands of years before Lionel Richie wrote this song, Solomon wrote this song. But what was he saying? What was he saying here? He's saying God's way is passionate. God's way is passionate. There's this misconception in the world today that, that if you do things God's way when it comes to intimacy, it's boring and that it's, it's, not, it's weird and, and we're not going to talk about it. Again, this is kind of what we talked about earlier and that the, to have any kind of fun, it's, it, you got to do it the devil's way. And that's a lie. That is a lie that he has distorted and twisted. That's the enemy's plan is to make you think that God's way is not fun. It is not passionate. But God's way is passionate because he created it. He knows exactly how it's supposed to be. God created it to be enjoyable, pleasurable, and fun in the context of marriage. 
I want to just say that again. This is the only container that it's okay in, in the context of marriage. But the truth is this. Passion takes effort. It's easy to have a lot of passion when you're first married, but as you grow in your relationship, passion begins to take some effort. You've got to do the work to have intimacy in your marriage. Think of it again, like a fireplace, like we used, you know, when you light a fire, when it's originally burning, it's warm and giving off heat and it's great. But over time, if you don't do anything to that fire, it's going to die out. You got to get up. You got to go get some more logs. You got to put logs on the fire. You got to stoke it. You got to blow on it. You got to do all the things to keep the fire hot. And somehow we quit doing that in our, rela- our marriage relationships over time. We lose the passion because we've quit doing the work it takes to have passion in your marriage. It takes some effort. Men, you got to put some effort in. All the things you did early on when you were real romantic, you were... You know, you were date night was every night, you know, and you were bringing her home flowers and you were making dinner plans and you were super romantic, leaving her notes and texting her, you know, or writing sticky notes on the window. You were doing all of these things that was romantic and then over time you just quit doing them and you wonder why the passion's gone. It takes work and it takes effort. Ladies, you can do work as well in this. Don't wear sweats and turtlenecks every night to bed, right? (laughs) I'm just saying... Like, don't wear the masks that people wear to bed every night. That's scary. When he comes home, don't be wearing what he, the sweats you woke up in. I mean, I know they're comfortable, but you didn't do that early on. You didn't do that when you first got married, okay? Oh, come on. I'm just saying, you got everybody has to work. A lot of men, amen, in here at the North. I knew that y'all would be into this one, man. All right. You might have to schedule. You might have to schedule your romance, okay? Put it on the calendar. You can't imagine this when you first get married. You're like, what are you talking about? Why would we ever need to put it on the calendar? Because kids and time and jobs and all kinds of stuff come in, and you've got to be thoughtful about this and just thinking about this. I don't want the fire to burn out of my marriage, so if it takes putting on a calendar, I'm going to put it on a calendar. A Tuesday can be a special day. Just take a day, pick a day. You know, listen, just be proactive about being passionate in your marriage. Light some candles, man. Make dinner. Get the kids babysitters, right? Put on a little Luther Vandross, whatever. I mean, whatever your thing is. Maxwell, Boys to Men, Hillsong, whatever. Whatever your thing is, work on it. Work on it, okay? That's all I'm trying to say. You can have some fun. Hillsong's great. Okay. Never mind. Why did I do this? All right, let's go on. Just kidding. All right, verse 7. He says, you're altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no flaw in you. This is a powerful phrase. He's saying, every part of you is beautiful. You are perfect. And we know, people, that every person has flaws, right? So what was he trying to do? He was saying, I don't see any flaw in you. I'm overlooking these flaws. But what the enemy wants you to do is he wants you to see the perfect somewhere else in the imperfect in what you have. And he's trying to reaffirm, no, I think you're perfect. I don't see any flaw in you. And you, this, is the, this is one of the major problems against all the problems that are with pornography is that it causes you, pornography causes you to set someone else up as a standard against your spouse. And you begin to compare. And this is what he's saying, no, I'm, you're the standard. I'm looking at you. I'm not looking at anybody else. There is no comparison. It's incredibly important that you begin to affirm your spouse in this way, because what happens is it creates a security. And that's the next point is that God's way provides security. There needs to be a security in the most intimate moments of your life with your spouse. You, you should never say anything demeaning about your spouse's body. You, you should never put them down or say anything negative. And men, if she says, does this look beautiful on me? The answer is 100% of the time, yes. And there is no pause. I made this mistake one time, and it wasn't for a negative reason. I was just, I don't know what was wrong with me. Uh, And it did not work out well for me. I had to go back and give a bunch of affirmation. But you can't pause. Don't ever say anything negative because you'll ruin that security that's there in your spouse. Men, listen, just the reality of it is, is that time and kids and, you know, as you age, they, they affect our bodies. Gravity affects our bodies, right? So as we get older, that's just what happens. We don't get younger, we get older. 
That's why the Bible is clear in Proverbs 31 that charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. It will go away, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. It's not always about the outside, but if you begin to affirm the outside like he was and saying, I see no flaw in you, you will stay in love with your wife forever because you're not comparing anybody to her. She's perfect the way that she is. And if you will affirm that, you will always have intimacy in your marriage. Ladies, you can do the same thing for your husband. We get insecure too. Okay, don't don't point out his gut or his love handles or the fact that his hair has moved from here to his back. Right. It's it happens. It's just a part of life. I'm just trying to help you today. Okay, you'll create an insecurity. Just say, hey, that's my young stag right there. Remember, that was a couple that was last week. Young stag is perfectly acceptable. For some reason, she was so much better with the lines than he was. His were weird and hers for men were like, yeah, I like that. Anyway. Because here's the truth and the reality of this is when you're married, you are your spouse's only legitimate way to find fulfillment in this area. And the scripture is actually very clear on this. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says that men, your body's not your own. It belongs to your wife. Ladies, your body's not your own. It belongs to your husband. And he says, I actually only permit you taking a break from this when you're praying and fasting. But afterwards, come back together quickly so the enemy does not tempt you and pull you away through temptation. You've got to realize if I don't create this security within my marriage, I'll begin to look somewhere else or they'll begin to look somewhere else. And you are your spouse's only way to find legitimate fulfillment in this area when you're married. When you're not married, you don't need to be finding fulfillment in this area, period. Okay? I say that to you in love. It is the right container for it. Okay? All right, let's move on to the next verse. He says, now he's still, still talking to her. He says, you have stolen my heart. My sister, my bride, I'll just pause there. He's not calling. We already know, not from Arkansas, West Virginia. He's not my sister. I'm sorry again. I'm sorry. That one was planned. Okay. Uh, he's, it's just a word for her. My sister, my bride, you have stolen my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. Then he goes on to say, how delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine? That should sound familiar. This is how we started this chapter off, or this book off at the beginning. She was telling him, your love is better than wine. In other words, you love so well. I love the way that you love. Now he's saying it back to her. Oh, your love is better than wine. I love the way that you love. This is a reciprocating relationship and the fragrance of your perfume more than any other spices. And then look at this. He says, your lips drop sweetness as the honeycomb. My bride, milk and honey are under your tongue and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. This is, this, this is a kiss that we're seeing from them. And it's not just a normal kiss. It's a different type of kiss. Okay. Cause one, they're married, my bride. I'd like to point that out. And this is a kiss that the French have claimed. But this was a long time ago. This was a Hebrew kiss. And you know it's because how would he know what's under her tongue? I'm just saying. It's in the Bible. But I want to point out, he said my bride first. They're married. Now, the reason I say that is, is because Tandra and I, when we first, we decided, or I decided with her, it was the first person I did this with, I'm not going to kiss her till we get engaged. So the day I put a ring on her finger, I kissed her. And two weeks later, we stopped. We're like, we're waiting until marriage. Because things began to progress in my emotions. I began to want more. It wasn't enough to just kiss. I wanted this type of kiss. Or I wanted the honey and the milk. <laughs> I'm just reading the Bible. So we decided, no, we got to shut that down. Why? Because what happens is, is you're, when you do this, you're starting an engine for a race you're not ready to run. And when, you're, when your engine's revving up, you can't downshift without damaging the car. And this is what I'm trying to tell you is that this needs to wait until marriage. Amen. They were married. And this is the context that we're seeing in this. Let me go on to the next one. Look at verse 12. You are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed in a sealed fountain. If you remember early on, the garden was a picture of her body. She was saying, I'm a vineyard, I'm a garden, right? This was the picture of who she is. And he was saying, I'm so thankful that you waited for me. 
that you were locked up, that you were enclosed, that you were sealed. This is the picture that you waited, that we know that she was a virgin and she was waiting on him. This is something different than a lot of people do today. And the picture is, is this, is that God's way is holy. It's set apart. She waited. And when you do it God's way, it's a holy approach. And you can look at this in the scripture and in Genesis, and Jesus talked about it in the New Testament. But in Genesis, when Adam and Eve came together, it says, this is, for this reason, man shall leave his father and mother and be united into one flesh when they get married. This is the picture of uniting into one flesh. It's an outward picture of an inward covenant that was created that God designed to be holy in the context of marriage. And I realize Unfortunately, many people, maybe most people, they don't do it God's way today. They, they haven't kept themselves for marriage. And maybe you're, maybe you're that way. Maybe the enemy has lied to you today and said that, you know, well, I must not be holy because I didn't do it right. Or I must not be holy today because I'm not perfect. And I just want you to know today that holiness isn't perfect. It's forgiven. There are no perfect people. Everybody has a past. But God, this is the way that he set it up, that he can forgive you and heal you and and make you holy again. That's why he sent Jesus, because by ourselves, we cannot make ourselves holy. Jesus came to die on the cross. This is the gospel, by the way, so that we could be cleansed from our sins. We could be made holy and set apart again and then receive the Holy Spirit to walk out that holiness today. It's not in our own power. It comes through him. And I want you to know that no matter what you've been through, no matter what your past looks like, God can redeem and heal and restore anything, including you and your purity today. But this picture we're seeing is this is the picture of the way that God intended it to be, that God's way is holy. And let's keep reading here in the last few verses. He says, you are a garden, a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon. A beautiful picture of a growing relationship. And now she speaks for the first time in this chapter. And she says, awake, north wind, and come, south wind. Blow on my garden that its fragrance may spread everywhere. I'm not going to tell you what that means, but I want to point out one thing. Awake. For the other verses, what has she said? Don't arouse or awaken. Don't awake. But now that we're married, awake. It's time to awaken this passion because it's in the right context. And the north wind was a strong wind and the south wind was a gentle wind. And it's a picture of a beautiful relationship coming together, God's way. And then it goes on to say in the next verse, let my beloved come into his garden and taste of its choicest fruits. We're together now. I am yours. You are mine. My garden is your garden. Your garden is my garden. And this is a picture of we've waited, we've done this right, we've kept the foxes out. Remember we talked last week about the little foxes that would try to come and steal the fruit off the vine before it's time, before it's ripe. No, he's saying now we have the fruit because we protected it from what was coming in from the outside and we're enjoying the fruit of a great relationship now. This is God's picture and God's way of relationships. And it's not just right, it's better. There's a blessing that comes when you do it God's way. But I do want to speak to this issue today that I've already kind of alluded to. Is Sometimes a message like this can be very hard to hear. Again, maybe you've made some mistakes in the past. And maybe, maybe you gave your virginity away a long time ago. Or maybe you're currently living in an unholy relationship. And the, and the enemy would come to you and try to make you feel shame and guilt and make you think that you're unredeemable and you're unholy and your life is ruined now and you can't have a great marriage. And those are all lies that have been twisted from the enemy. Maybe, maybe today you had this stolen from you. You didn't give it away, but it was taken. And the enemy has lied to you and said, you're tainted, you're damaged. You'll never have a great marriage. You'll never have a great relationship. And that's a lie. Because what God does is he redeems and he restores and he heals. If you make a commitment to allow him to forgive you or heal you, he'll restore you. In Isaiah chapter 1, the Bible says that God says, Though their sins be like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. God can make anyone pure and holy from this day going forward. And I realize most people haven't done this right, but that's why we bring God into the situation to heal us and to change us and to realize that Jesus makes all things new. 
He makes every relationship new. He makes every life new, every marriage new. If you feel like you, you've messed up a hundred times today, God can make you new. So what I'd like us to do is I'd like us at both campuses and online, if you would just stand with me and I'm gonna take a minute to pray and I'm gonna invite my wife, Tandra, up here to join me. If you're with your spouse, I want you to take them by the hand or put your arm around them. And I just wanna pray for single people or people who are courting or dating or wanna be married one day. And then I wanna pray for married people. If you would just bow your heads with me. Lord, I just pray right now, God, for every person at the sound of my voice, God, who is single, Lord, or in a relationship or wants to be married one day, God, I pray, Father, for the strength and for the courage, God, to set godly standards in their lives, Lord. Not to look to the world's broken way of doing things, God, but I pray that they would take a stand today, God, and say, I'm going to be holy from this day forward. Lord, if they've messed up, Lord, I ask that you would forgive them, you would heal them, God, and you'd give them the strength, God, to stand in a righteous way until the day that they're married. And Lord, I pray, God, for every married couple today. I bind the attack of the enemy over marriages today, God. He's been an all-out attack on marriages, Lord, but I claim them back in the name of Jesus. I pray for every marriage, Lord, that feels like it's dead today. I pray that you would breathe life back into it, God. I pray that you would light the fire of passion in those marriages today. I pray, God, that they would keep everything from the world outside, God, and begin today to follow what you say in your word. I pray, God, for strong and healthy marriages. I pray that the blood of Jesus cover every marriage today, God. And what was once dead, I declare today, God, will be a blooming, fruitful garden, Lord. I pray for every marriage at the sound of my voice to be restored and healed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. I pray this message encouraged you, inspired you, and maybe even challenged you a little bit. If you made a decision for Jesus, we are celebrating with you. Welcome to the family of God. We would love to know about it. So message us online or you can text yes card to 903-200-3808 and let us know what decision you made. We wanna come alongside you, help you find a local church. It's very important to be connected to the local body of Christ, whether with us or somewhere else. So let us know so we can help you and let you know your next steps with Jesus. I'd love to see you real soon in person, but until then, know that I'm praying for you. I'm praying God's best in your life. God bless you.